Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Jen Riley. I am the communications specialist for the Office of Sustainability here at Tufts University. And I would like to welcome you all to the fourth installment in the Path to Carbon Neutrality webinar series hosted by the Tufts Office of Sustainability. Our next webinar, which will be in February, we will hear from Darius Ratskowski, the Director of Engineering in Facility Services, and Andrea Wolfell, Operations and Maintenance Planning Manager at the Tufts Central Energy Plant on the Medford Somerville campus. And they will be discussing how Tufts plans and implements energy efficiency projects on our campuses and specifically how the CEP boosts the energy efficiency of the Medford Somerville campus. So in today's, we will hear from Patty Close, Director of Dining and Business Services and Kelly Shaw, Nutrition Marketing Specialist for Tufts Dining about how their team is currently working on sourcing food locally, purchasing fair trade and organic ingredients, creating delicious plant-based menus and reducing food waste at Tufts. So just a warning, this is your last chance to grab a snack in case you get hungry during the talk. Um, so if you need a minute, go ahead and do that now. Um, we are also joined today by Charu Vijay, an intern in our office and a Tufts eco rep. Um, and we will be joined by Tina Wolston, who is the Director of Sustainability here at Tufts University. Hi, Jen. Sorry. I have oh, hello. Here. <laughs> um, so to introduce our speakers today, Patty. I think she's introducing me to introduce the speakers. So I can introduce the speakers. Hi, everybody. I'm Tina Wilson, the Sustainability Program Director. Um, and I am pleased to introduce Patty Kloss, who's been working at Tufts since uh, 1989 and is the Director of Dining and Business Services. Um, and she's played an integral role in many of the sustain uh, sustainability dining initiatives you hear about today. Uh, and I am thrilled to be able to say that I've worked with um, Patty for many years uh, and she had, let me see, I lost my, okay. um, she's, I've worked with her for many years and, and I know she loves creating a healthy community for tough students and the smart, hardworking and dedicated staff that she works with. And she's always looking for new and innovative ways to incorporate sustainability practices into dining services. I remember when I first got to Tufts, one of my first meetings was with, with Patty and they showed me their sustainability plan. And this was like 14 years ago. I was so impressed. Um, so besides starting composting in the dining halls, like in 1994, I think it was so long ago, she has installed highly efficient uh, dishwashers. She's reimagined the commencement lunch, which serves, I think, 7,000 people to be uh, zero waste. She introduced trailless dining and reusable takeout containers to campus. And all in all, she's been a great champion on campus. And next, along with her, Kelly Shaw joined the university a few years ago, and she's a registered dietitian and nutrition specialist for Tufts Dining. And in this role, she works with students to accommodate a wide variety of dietary needs with the support, of course, of a talented and dedicated culinary team. So she enjoys working at the intersection of nutrition and sustainability and believes in the power of bringing people together over a good meal. Um, and she's worked with the eco reps uh, on Meatless Mondays and Scrape Your Plate initiatives, which has been, I know, really great for them too. So welcome to you both. I'm really excited to hear about um, your what you're gonna talk about today. Thank you for that introduction, Tina, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to everyone on uh, what I think Jennifer titled, Farm to Plate, Reducing the Footprint of Tufts Dining. Uh, next slide, Kelly. So just to give you an overview, Kelly, can you go to the next slide? Uh, some quick facts about dining services. We have 10 locations on the Medford, Somerville, and SMFA campus. 
they um, we think of them as our residential dining program where the bulk of the meals are consumed by our students. This is a picture of the interior of DeWick McPhee Dining Center, one of our largest dining centers. We've got six retail locations, five on the Medford Somerville campus, one at the SMFA. We have a catering group that has been um, that uh, it, pre COVID served about 1500 events a year. And we have a central kitchen and a bakery. So in more typical times, about 2 million meals are served annually, which means that we have a big footprint and we know it. Uh, this year, we're projecting that we're going to spend over $7 million on food. That doesn't include disposables and cleaning products. And when you consider all of the uh, full-time and part-time uh, right, employees that are Tufts employees, we have some part-time temporary employees, a management leadership team, and student employees, we number almost 300 individuals who are making all that meals for everyone. Next slide. So Tina, thank you in the introduction for highlighting some of the things um, that we've accomplished over the years. And this is really meant as a very high level, and you're going to be hearing more specifically about some of these initiatives. But I had the good fortune of working with uh, one of Tina's predecessors back in the early 90s on a strategic plan for the department. And at that time, we thought of the impact that a dining program has as having as driving a need for us to be good environmental stewards. And so a strategic plan even then continues to drive our actions and our intentions today. It was two UEP graduate students that actually helped us find a uh, farmer in Tewksbury, which was our first iteration of composting. And when that fell through, they actually located a waste hauler who had windrows at Franklin Park Zoo that became the first iteration of composting that goes on today. I believe it was 2014 that the Commonwealth mandated composting for institutional feeders or, or food service operators of a certain size, but it was a collaboration with other people who had goals and vision aligned with ours that helped us figure out how to do that. Um, Tina, maybe later you can explain the name of the course that you have taught that um, through the X College that um, enables students to come up with projects that have a specific impact right on campus. But trayless dining got introduced in the mid 2000s and our campus wasn't ready until a group of students actually did some wonderful research that impressed me so much that I actually hired a couple of them to conduct a pilot for us that turned into the trayless initiative that we have today. And in fact, there are probably some students in the audience that don't even know what I'm talking about in terms of trays. But this uh, timeline is really meant to illustrate some of our milestones and to emphasize the fact that it's through collaborations that we've been able to achieve so many of the things that we do. Next slide. These are the primary areas of focus uh, for us as a program. And we'll be touching on a bit of this every day. Oh, environmental action, yeah. Thanks, Tina, we'll talk about that more. So you're gonna hear a bit about our efforts to reduce our landfill waste uh, by 3% annually. And part of that is by introducing reusable containers. Uh, we're part of the New England Food Vision, which is to produce or procure or source 50% of what's consumed in New England uh, from New England businesses by 2060. So you'll hear about achieving 20 by 20, which was an initial goal. Now our goal is 30% local sourcing by 2030 and on and on. Uh, you'll hear more about who we've been collaborating with and uh, as well as Kelly will go into quite a bit of uh, detail about how we've made changes to make our menus more sustainable. Next slide. So I like to brag about this. We introduced a um, reusable beverage container probably more than 15 years ago. And we've gone through several iterations, including a coffee mug. But the clear uh, Nalgene bottle you see here in the center of this slide is something that we were giving out to entering students for about 12 years pre-COVID. So it was paused because of the pivots and changes that had to be introduced during this time period uh, in our response to this pandemic that's going on. And so instead of giving out a water bottle the fall of 2020, we actually gave out reusable silverware, which you can see in the top right portion of this slide. And I'm so happy that others helped us find a stainless steel item with a really good quality knife 
for a disposable. And it also has chopsticks, of course, a fork and a spoon. And then we chose to add a reusable straw and a straw cleaner. And so I believe the Green Fund awarded one of their prizes to an initiative brought forward by a graduate school uh, in Boston. And they'll actually be distributing 200 sets of these to graduate students there in the near future. So uh, this is an opportunity that we really couldn't pass up because we know how damaging the plastic um, silverware can be. The green container in the lower right corner was something we'd introduced in the fall of 2019 and had to be paused once we were into COVID. But it is a very sturdy three compartment container that is washable. And uh, if taken care of properly, you can get probably two to 300, about 280 to 300 uses. And so we were able to reintroduce it this fall. It's temporarily on hold because of the Omicron surge. But I'm hearing from our medical team that it's peaked and that we're likely to be able to shift back into using our reusables. And then last but not least is the lovely reusable bag that you see there, which was a collaboration with the student government at Tufts and was issued to uh, returning students in January of 2021. And I do see some students carrying it around and we hope that this whole collection of reusables will become something that we can really promote and help students get their hands on these pieces in the coming months if they don't have them, didn't receive them or haven't used them yet. So um, we're really proud that we've got this complement of items and want to increase the ability for students to use this as they move about campus and obtain food for themselves through the course of the day. Next slide, Kelly. I will touch a bit on waste, uh, one aspect of waste reduction or a way of thinking about waste reduction that goes far beyond containers or composting, which is the waste that comes from being energy or water inefficient or the waste that comes or used to come, we believe, from students having trays where they would fill up with lots of food, but perhaps maybe not consume it all. Um, we focus on batch and from scratch cooking so that we have ingredient control, not only on the sourcing side, but as a way to use as much of the edible product as possible so that we're not even putting food into the landfill. And I know again, Kelly will talk more about who we partner with and how we're able to donate food to uh, people who um, perhaps wouldn't benefit from the generosity of, of Tufts in the program, but also as a way to ensure that food doesn't go into the waste stream, but in fact can be consumed by individuals. In 2012, we had the opportunity to marry a capital program with the Deferred Maintenance Program. Uh, there was some work going on in the DeWick McPhee Dining Facility, and we decided to replace our dish machine several years ahead of schedule, because in doing so, not only, uh, how much water we saved was actually half, our water usage was cut in half. And the new technology that we were able to adopt through this particular style of machine meant that the noise level in the uh, surrounding area was greatly reduced. The radiant heat that would come off the machine because it's so much more energy efficient and better insulated made for a much more pleasant work environment for the employees and all those things were significant wins for us. And every time a piece of equipment needs to be replaced or as we're thinking about our two to five year replacement plan, we're always looking for ways to reduce our energy footprint, reduce our water consumption, reduce the amount of water going into the waste. Next slide. Kelly, I think uh, you step in here to start to talk about the various collaborations and educational programs we partner with. Yes, we have many opportunities for collaboration. And I, I think of this as, as the fun part <laughs> because I get to work with amazing students uh, and have several partnerships that I'd like to highlight here. I would like also to put out there that we're always looking for more, we think the dining centers are a great laboratory for research or education, and we welcome ideas and partnerships. So please uh, keep us in mind uh, as you do your work on campus or um, have ideas for us. Uh, so I'd first like to talk about new entry. When we're looking to increase our uh, local food spend, we don't have to look any further than the New Entry Sustainable Farming Project, which is right here at Tufts. And so we've worked um, 
with them in the past to do some farmers markets for I think about seven years. Uh, we've purchased food directly from them for our menus uh, and, and have done some events featuring new entry that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, Tufts Dining is also part of the Tufts Food Rescue Collaborative where we work with students to capture food that um, can't be used anymore by our dining centers and uh, rescue that food. We partner with Food for Free to provide meals for the community surrounding Tufts. And uh, these students have been a fixture in our dining centers for about five years now. And uh, all of these things, of course, have a big asterisk in that they were derailed or kind of um, stunted by COVID, but we're excited to be getting those up and running again this semester. The eco reps are also pillars of um, our dining centers. Every Monday, we have students in both dining centers highlighting Meatless Monday, which has been a really um, well-received event that we've expanded uh, this last year. And we also have scrape your plate events um, that focus on raising awareness uh, for food waste. So I'll talk, whoops, sorry about that. First about more in detail about um, the Tufts Food Rescue Collaborative. So as I mentioned, we have student volunteers that come in to both dining centers, Carmichael and DeWick, to um, bag food that otherwise would be wasted. We can't use it anymore. It hasn't gone out on the serving line. Um, it's, it's not food that has been touched by a consumer, but it's collected and portioned into these family meals. It's called the program is called the Heat and Eat Meal Program that we um, create these meals at DeWick using food from Carmichael or DeWick. And we also donate bulk food uh, that hasn't been placed into a meal, but we send that to Food for Free and they're able to create meals with that food at their own facilities. This infographic shows the information from this past fall. Uh, so it says 500 packaged meals with 518 pounds of food saved. I will say that this is actually pretty low uh, for a variety of reasons. One, that because of COVID, it took us a bit to kind of get the dust off the, the wheels and get the process going. And second of all, um, the pounds of food saved is only meals produced, we were not able to donate any bulk food to Food for Free because of um, their limitations with COVID. But we are hopefully um, going to resume that in a few weeks and meal production is resuming at the end of the month. We have about almost 30 students, three to four shifts a week. It's a great opportunity to to volunteer, get to know other like-minded students, and kind of see behind the scenes at DeWick um, and make some meals, it's really fun. And another opportunity to get involved for students is with Meatless Monday. Uh, as I mentioned, this has been something that we've had for quite a few years. Uh, we increased our involvement or up their game, I guess, uh, in that Carmichael in the spring of last year decided to redesign their menus for Monday and uh, made a completely meatless dinner for Monday. Um, in the past, it was a voluntary program. Students, uh, eco reps were had tables at the event and were talking to students, encouraging them to make meatless selections for the meal. Carmichael um, currently has an entirely meat-free dinner menu on Mondays in support of this program. It was kind of by student demand that uh, we decided to make that change. It's been really well received uh, and we've seen consistent numbers to support, uh, to support that continuing, which is great. Uh, we also have, I mean, we have a variety of vegan and vegetarian dishes on all of our menus daily, um, particularly entrees. And those are labeled VG is vegan, V is vegetarian. And in, in the past year, uh, we've actually increased the number of vegan entrees and vegetarian entrees at lunch and dinner, again, due to demand. I, I think that 
the the number of students interested in vegan and vegetarian dishes is increasing. They're also generally um, very vocal. <laughs> so we do hear that feedback a lot, uh, but we're increasing the availability of vegan and vegetarian entrees. And DeWick is experiencing a change change to the vegan platform, or it's going to be exclusively vegan instead of vegan and vegetarian. So what this means is that we have uh, intermixed the vegetarian entrees instead of locating them in, in one at one platform, you're going to see those mixed in with the other meat entrees. And I know there are different schools of thought about, you know, some vegetarian students like to have everything in one place. Um, we're kind of looking to see if this will increase the selection of these dishes by students that don't identify as vegetarian, um, but just making things more widely available across multiple platforms. Uh, and then we also have a lot of special events and fun things that happen uh, in the dining centers and around campus. We, in October of last year, DeWick uh, featured a new entry harvest dinner with featuring produce from new entry. The chefs created a brand new menu and uh, featuring the cabbage and kale and carrots um, and squash that we received from the farm. New entry was at the event. We were able to, we had a, a quiz that students could fill out or to enter a drawing for some hot sauce that was made with ingredients grown at the farm. Um, and it's a great way to spread the word about new entry. When we took, or the quiz results showed that um, students at Tufts are not familiar with new entry. So it was a great way to introduce that to them um, and start the discussion about, uh, you know, the, the carbon footprint of your meal or the greenhouse gas emissions of your food, those kinds of things. Uh, we also have Smoothie Tuesdays at Carmichael. Uh, Falafel Burgers was an event at Hodgden. So uh, all of the units on campus are um, using these principles when they're designing their menus and events. So Tufts Dining is part of the Menus of Change, which um, is a, an organization that was started by the Culinary Institute of America and Stanford about, I would say, was it 10, 12 years ago? Um, and these principles are the kind of the, the driving force behind this initiative. And so, these provide chefs and food service leaders with menu and recipe guidance that's related to health. Many of them have overlapping health and sustainability um, impact, uh, along with business strategies that integrate both the environmental and the nutrition science imperative. So in June of 2021, I worked with a team of chefs here at Tufts to determine how we would use these principles to define our menu for the coming year. We had been working on them, you know, they're always at the forefront of our minds, but we wanted to really focus and, and maybe choose some new ones and, and continue to push forward with these initiatives. And so we chose, we chose 10 to focus on this year. Um, and each unit on campus, as I mentioned, whether retail or residential, they have their own unique style and vision, but these principles are at the forefront uh, when, they're, when they're planning their menus and developing new recipes each year. So we focus um, some that are relevant to this discussion. I was on the committee too, so there are a few nutrition focused ones as well, but uh, we are serving more seafood more often. We use Foley fish and we are, we looked at how much fish was on the menu in general and the source of that fish, whether it's salmon, whether it's kind of a processed breaded filet, and we're really focusing on using more white fish that is found in waters near Boston. Um, so we've added, increased the number of fish dishes. Dwick, the chefs at Dwick wrote about 30 new fish recipes uh, for this new semester. We're buying local, global, and seasonal. We've enhanced our network of local farms 
Uh, we've added Verrill Farm, which is nearby. Uh, we partner with Horse Listeners Orchard um, and continuing to um, meet our local spend goals. And we are reducing the portion sizes with emphasis, emphasis on calorie quality over quantity. Um, I, I can't see the chat, but I wish if there are students out there, I wish you could write in what you think the most, one of the, what the popular dishes are. Um, and I guess I'll just give away the answer, but one of those is General Gao's chicken. Uh, that's extremely popular. Every place that sells it gets absolutely bombarded. And one of the things that chefs look at is how we can um, balance the cost and also the, the protein of that by adding, so one of the things that the chefs did was add broccoli to the dish to balance that out. And of course, we still have students that, you know, pick through and pick, avoid the broccoli and only pick out the chicken, but it's a way to um, balance the impact of that dish while still keeping it on the menu. Uh, we're also focusing on whole minimally processed foods. We have a large pool of culinary talent. Uh, we are uh, utilizing that and of course balancing the labor impact versus the cost. Uh, we're trying to limit our use of ready to eat items. Uh, Carmichael, which has recently converted to be gluten tree nut and peanut free has is a great example of this and that they're making all of their they're not able to rely on those products the way that they once were and so um, they're making a lot of great things from scratch and quickly we're reimagining dairy in a supporting role so making sure we have alternative milks uh, and more recipes um, thinking about how we're using cheese and and other dairy products and, and just thinking about the overall balance of the menu. Um, these aren't things that, that can come quickly. You know, we, we do have a wide variety of, of palates and dietary needs and, and students' preferences that we're balancing, but we feel that we can, as we implement these things slowly with, with thought and, and also conveying to students why we're making these choices, that um, they'll be well received. As part of the menus of change, we are a part of a, a research collaborative arm of that. Um, and we participate in the research, it's called the Collective Impact uh, Report. And where we have um, participated for two years and it is, um, so protein has been determined by the Menus of Change initiative and related platforms to be the single most important area of change with respect to advancing healthier, more sustainable menus. So we are using this, our participation in this report to look at what our numbers are and where we can reimagine our protein portfolios. So the opportunities for improving the pro combined protein portfolio and have an impact as Tufts, you know, individually, but also as part of this collective of other universities. So this, we, as I said, we 2019 was our first year of participation. 2020 was a wacky year. So the, um, you know, the baseline that we're trying to establish will take some time as each year is has been extremely different, um, but they they do present it as um, pounds of CO2 per pound of food, which keeps it relative um, and, and um, independent of the total number of meals served. But this is something that we will continue to monitor. The MCURC, which is the name of the collaborative, has um, a goal to reduce food-related greenhouse gas emissions by 25% by 2030, uh, with the understanding that this will look different for, for everyone. So, um, and of course, be influenced by circumstances and, and purchasing year to year. So uh, it's not going to be a smooth curve, but um, it is something that we are looking at and, um, and we'll continue to, to monitor. 
I think that's it for us. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Um, I have, I know Patty has been answering questions uh, in the chat. Thank you, Patty. Um, there's a couple more that came in through the Q&A um, that I would love to have you guys answer. Now, the first one is, um, actually all these questions are from Akbota, which, but they're great questions. So uh, where do you still see gaps in our dining sustainability programs and what would it take to fill those gaps? Patty, do you want to, you're, you're on uh, mute. I was just asking Kelly if she wanted to start. Um, I, I can, and if you want to chime in. So um, it's a great question and hard for me to frame. Um, I think about it as multi-pronged. And so um, improvements to the infrastructure of facilities, like the um, big change we made to the dish machine in DeWick, so that just, you know, um, being able to have much more energy efficient um, equipment, but you have to time it with availability of funds and, and schedule it in with all kinds of other work that's going on. So maybe on the macro level, what, what uh, the, the questioner was asking would be, uh, and it's starting in the operations division, a more integrated approach to the capital improvements that dining needs and desires to make to be seen as part of sustainable initiatives, not just equipment replacement and dining. It, does that make sense, Tina? So yeah. to, a gap would be to integrate more on the dimension of uh, capturing improvements in dining as part of the overall operating improvements that are happening. And then I think the other is that um, we all do this as part of our jobs. And so I think a gap would be, it would be fabulous if we had more resources to be able to augment the work you know that, that Kelly's taken on to help champion a lot of these things, but to have another partner on our team that can um, more directly address some of these sustainable initiatives that require uh, investigation or documentation or having systems to be able to better quantify. I'm sure people would love to know how many pounds in total do we buy, how many pools of milk, you know, being able to have this more quantified, and so. Um, and the third thing I would say is um, a way to interact with students individually and in different organizations to see what resonates with them and how they can be stronger partners to the initiatives we launch to make an even more Im impact, an even more greater impact in terms of food selection, um, how, how much they take for waste and finding ways to be stronger collaborators on that front as well. I realize how busy an undergraduate is in particular, and it's not always top of mind, but um, I think there's a gap maybe for me in terms of how to better bring things to a person's attention in a way that inspires them to be active as opposed to um, making it seem like we're telling you what to do. Yeah, that is a, uh, that is a, a challenge. Um, I know that in the past you have used some graduate students from the nutrition school. That's correct, right? And could you want, want to talk a little bit about what they've helped you do? Kelly, why don't you talk uh, about- the Yes, uh, yeah. so right before COVID, uh, we did have a grad student who helped. That was the first year that we participated in that collective impact report that I showed. And so uh, it was a really big job just kind of combing through the data and figuring out how we were going to collect it all and then um, presenting it to MCURC. Um, and I think that that, you know, I know we've talked Tina before about interns and I am, I know I've been saying it for a while, but I am actually about to post a position. I think that that's the gap that I have. I need some help <laughs> and, you know, there's, there are, um, you know, with the collective impact, continuing to participate in that. Uh, I'm also looking at greenhouse gas labeling on our menu. Is that something that could influence student choice? There's, there's other universities doing research around that, uh, but that, you know, takes time and um, would is a great job for a student, I think. Um, Absolutely. 
Great, thank you both. There's another question, which is, um, what other unforeseen changes to the dining sustainability programs has the pandemic made? made? Uh, I'll start, two things come to mind. One is, um, particularly at the beginning of the pandemic and, and maybe even now in supply chain issues. And so um, our desire to work with some of the smaller local businesses and their ability to produce and the unpredictability where shortages occur um, or um, you know a product that's that's available but difficulty getting it to campus you know all of those kinds of things so it's been very uneven unpredictable um, we did work with uh, one of our suppliers a very small farm in Connecticut and actually made some advanced purchases of uh, items potatoes apples carrots tomatoes things that we know we would use so there was some um, you know, you put a deposit on a on a house when it's being constructed, or you might put a deposit on construction, you know, so the contractor can get started. So we did that with far, with this farmer so that they could get their seed and get their crop in the ground. And then interesting, you know, when the product started getting delivered to campus, the unit wasn't invoiced because it had been prepaid. And so, um, so, so that was one, the whole supply chain thing is one. The other is students have changed in terms of what they're choosing on the menu. I mean, we have made some menu adaptations. The chefs are always interested in enhancing. And, you know, Kelly talked a lot about the kind of things we're focusing on, but by and large, I think students have chosen less of some of the vegan or, or plant-based foods or the way they were using our serveries because we had to implement a certain style of service for certain periods of time. And I think students got conditioned to only going to certain places in the servery and having these big long lines and distancing and all this. And as we've been able to repopulate, if you will, and, and offer more variety again, um, it seems as if they're just bypassing some of this opportunity uh, and not even selecting some of the items. So I don't know if they're real, if their tastes have truly changed or if it's just a matter of the conditioning. I mean, again, it'd be interesting to hear from students about that, but but that was something that I would have never in my you know my wildest dreams predicted would be an impact right now. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, students on the call, if you want to um, put comments about that into the chat, it'd be really interesting to hear your thoughts. Kelly, did you have anything um, you wanted to add to that, or should I move on? I think just you know obviously the grab and go service adding much more of that waste and then students having to learn how to you know they we focus a lot in regular times on on filling your plate with what you're going to eat you can always come back the, that kind of messaging and because they couldn't do that they I think students it, it was an adjustment to learn how much to take students were loading up they were trying to decrease the frequency of visits to the dining center so they wanted to take more we did see a lot of food waste related to that, um, you know, but I think as they, as it, it started to normalize, they are coming back in and at least able to kind of relearn how to walk around and see all of the things and not have to stay in one central line. Um, I think that that will improve. Yeah. Um, and actually a follow-up question, Patty, is I remember when I talked to you about 10 years ago about buying local foods, one of the big challenges at the time was the lack of processing plants in this area and how if you wanted to buy potatoes from Maine, they would be shipped to California for processing and then shipped back. I know a lot of work has been done in this area. Can you update me on, on where we stand now with processing plants and um, I, I don't know that it's, it's changed significantly at all. And so what we focus more on is, you know, trying to understand the whole supply chain, right? And so where are those things being grown? Where are they being further processed? Some of the work that um, new, uh, the New England Food Vision with Kendall Foundation, uh, you know, the Kendall Foundation was uh, offering these vision prizes. And so when they first launched that, um, we were a recipient along with uh, Boston College and Harvard University, and their approach was to really support collaborations and to try to and to support initiatives that could be replicated. And so uh, it was a, it was a 
a quarter of a million dollars actually is what the prize was. And it was the whole focus was about being able to extend the growing season by providing seed money for local growers for uh, hoop houses or cold storage, because there isn't a lot of that on this side of the state, but there is in central and western mass where there is more farmland. Um, and, and the same notion around being able to provide seed money so that things could be further processed. I know there's a lot of progress happening in Rhode Island, Farm Fresh, some of those things. I just don't think we've been able to get traction here closer to Boston because of the COVID, uh, you know, the impact that COVID is having right. on things. But I, I think, um, I can't speak for Kendall, but I, I know they're, they're uh, the way they're able to use their funds has been impacted, but I don't believe they've uh, strayed from their mission uh, and hope that we can revisit that going forward. Interesting. Great. Next question um, is, uh, how are dining workers involved in the sustainability practices and programs? Yeah, um, we use a variety of ways to involve and communicate with our staff. When it's possible, we have um, gatherings of the whole team at the start of a semester. And so it was a couple of years ago, but I think we were in um, the Cohen Auditorium and a member of your team, uh, Tina, came and talked about our, our recycling program and, and how we separate waste. And so sometimes we're able to do things on a department level, certainly at a unit level, because not every, lo well, most locations compost now, but conversations are had at the start of the semester or throughout a semester with um, the team. So it, and sometimes it's more specific to certain tasks that you do, but we try to make sure that they um, are, uh, that we brief them on what our objectives are, what it looks like, what their role is in it. Sometimes they give us ideas. Um, many of them really look forward to the volunteers from Tufts Food Rescue Collaborative who come in to help take care of that food and, and uh, get it ready for the next consumer. And so um, some, sometimes these updates happen in team huddles um, sometimes it's a little more passive through signage and things like that, but it's an ongoing process because the, the team uh, turns over, you know, members join us and, and retire or move on to other things. And so it really, it has to take several forms in order for, uh, to keep people apprised. Great. Thank you. Um, what is Tufts dining policy on students using their own reusable self-cleaned takeout containers in DeWick and Carmichael? Thanks for asking that, Max. And they are prohibited. And that is not a Tufts dining policy. That is a board of health policy. And I think you'll find that almost everywhere. So in order for food in that type of an operation to leave the operation, the operator, Tufts dining, must make the container available and it has to meet cleanliness standards. So, you know, we hope when you're using the reusable container, you at least empty it and bring it back the next time you're in a dining center so that we can wash it properly, it gets sanitized and stored um, so that we can provide it to you again. But you cannot bring in an outside container. The Board of Health uh, prohibits that. So we have to follow that. Great. Um, this is from Stephen Silverin. How do you envision meeting the 50% by 2060 goal given supply chain issues, seasonal seasonality in New England, et cetera? Um, and I think this is related. How are you currently increasing the procurement of local produce, dairy, meat, et cetera? And what best practices might you recommend for other higher ed campuses in Massachusetts? So three different questions. Well, it's really fits and starts. And so uh, to be fully transparent, we buy coffee that's processed in Connecticut. So it meets our 250 mile radius definition. It is not grown here. I don't know how many pounds of bananas we serve in a day or a week. It's a lot and they're not grown here. So, you know, it is very, very ambitious and it's not linear. Um, but to the extent that very, the goal, I think, is to create demand as well as working with the communities to, to figure out where you can partner up and, and pilot ideas so that they can grow, but it does take the involvement of, of the business community, of the policy makers. Uh, what we're trying to do is be open, receptive, uh, indicate you know, where the opportunities are, educate and, and um, collaborate with our peers in our procurement group uh, so that they understand you know, our objectives while magically balancing the cost, because I know how expensive it is to go to school at Tufts and really any institution of higher education, whether it's state or private. 
And so um, I think the other thing that I'll say, and particularly with Menus of Change University Research Collaborative, there are so many institutions in New England in particular who are working on this all the time. And so uh, sharing what we're learning, sharing what we're trying, um, is a way to figure out, oh, maybe there's someone here that I didn't know about or just opening up dialogue. Kelly, I saw you nod, I don't know if you wanna to add to that. Well, I, I was thinking that's actually one of the reasons why I like to be part of the MCURC, this collaborative, because there are, we do share best practices and there, there's a lot of information flowing, but the reality is it does look different for everyone. And you know our, our partner schools, for in Wyoming, for example, their commitment to local beef looks different than what ours can be. And and there's room for that, you know. And but as a collective, we're moving towards some of these goals. But it really does look different for everyone. Great, thank you. Um, this is a related one. Um, uh, this is from George. I appreciate local sourcing, but how much of what you consume is imported, like coffee, olive oil, fruits, and spices, and how do you apply your sourcing principles to imports? I know you talked about that a little bit, but is there anything else that you would like to uh, add on? I think that? the thing that Kelly mentioned in terms of looking at our, our um, now I can't remember the words you use, you know, if you take the, cool, the, the, car, the, the carbon footprint of a food item, it, it, do you know what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. The greenhouse the gas greenhouse gas course. emissions, sure. Exactly, yes. So I know that um, some of our faculty at the Friedman School, for example, in the food, uh, agriculture, and environment program have um, seem to have a keen interest in this. And whether it's using, you know, the Cool Food Pledge tools to be able to try to do some calculating, um, because I know it's a complicated question, and something coming from farther away may have been produced more efficiently than something that's coming from closer. And so here's where we would invite collaborators to help us think through all those factors and what makes sense for now um, that may or may not um, be something that we can actually achieve, but important to know, we were an early adopter of cage-free eggs and we're not using them routinely as a shell egg. Um, and yet, we know that there's movement more on a policy front and in communities and frankly in the Commonwealth that are legislating or, or putting it out to the consumer to vote right on, you know, in the elections about what we want to do more long term and uh, Temple Grandin, you know, had said years ago, the producers of these that are of these large um, uh, chicken producers, the egg producers, their equipment's going to age out. And so there's these inflection points where, you know, you can be very targeted and try to help transition parts of industry in different areas because there's this natural question that's coming up. And so can a producer be more effective and have a different market for their product and achieve the goals we have that, that also help support their business model? So those are complex and we would be looking to others who are willing to delve in or perhaps are more knowledgeable that we could partner up with to really study and see where that fits into, you know, the next set of objectives that we want to take on. Great. And then one last question. Um, this is from Tanya Ternovsky, who is the director of programs at Farm to Institution New England. And so she is asking how reasonable do you feel it is to achieve the New England food vision and what would help address any challenges you face or foresee in your own local food sourcing efforts? It's really ambitious. <laughs> um, I think to, to really get there um, requires a lot of people to be open to thinking differently. You know, if we want what we want when we want it, we're not going to get there. <laughs> um, so it's, and yet that doesn't mean that we shouldn't keep striving and, and, you know, um, finding ways to collaborate and relying on, you know, other parts of at least our wonderful institution that are experts at policy or experts at, you know, community relations and collaborations and things like that. So um, you have to have a goal. Well, I think it's important to have goals and time, time have them time-based so that we're working towards something. But I think Tanya's pointing out at what point might we want to recalibrate that um, 
and uh, or even take it in a new direction uh, because climate change isn't waiting for us to get our act together, right? And so even though we may want these things, New England may not be able to produce certain things and that yeah. will have an impact whether anybody, you know, likes it or not, it's a reality. I heard um, someone suggesting, cause I guess Canada released uh, half of its maple syrup strategic reserve uh, recently. And someone was suggesting that we should all as a carbon mitigation um, effort plant a lot of maple syrup trees in Canada. And I support that effort. <laughs> Um, last question before we end is um, how might students um, be involved uh, in helping support these efforts? I know that there's some opportunities for working there, but are there ways they can advocate that you can think of either at the university, state or, state or national level, or are there ways they could volunteer or do stuff as a class project that would be helpful? I would say bring us your ideas. Um, there are many things that we hadn't thought of, or maybe we've thought of, but didn't know that anybody else was interested. So I love it when students reach out and say, you know, I've been thinking about this, or, you know, can we take this farther? Uh, sadly, nothing's springing to mind other than I know Kelly's going to be advertising an opportunity to help with some of this work um, and would, would hope that there'll be some interest in uh, partnering up with us on that. And if you know of legislature that is you know, coming down the pike, um, please let us know and we can, we can put that information out so that students who feel like being active can uh, solicit, reach out to their representatives. Great. Well, thank you both. Um, there are that we've reached the end of our questions. We have a little bit of time to give back to you, but we really appreciate the time you spent with us today. I want to, um, remind folks that the next the the next webinar i think as jen mentioned earlier is we'll uh, examine energy efficiency um, and i'll look at the deeper impact of the central energy plant on efficiency on the medford somerville campus the campus energy plant does uh serve the dining uh centers. Um, so it's all tied in together. And it's going to be Thursday, February 17th at 3 p.m. And if you follow the Office of Sustainability's social media or look at our website at sustainability.tufts.edu, um, you, you'll be able to see the registration link. Um, and then Tufts Dining itself has a lot of information about their efforts on their website. Um, and so that's dining.tufts.edu. Um, and you'll see there's, I think it's right on the homepage, there's a sustainability tab. Um, so I encourage people to look at that too. Wonderful. Thank you.